Welcome back to our talk on Christ the King, Our Lady of Fatima, and the Consecration of Russia. This is now the second part. We're calling it the diabolical attack on Christ the King and his vicar. Again, we'll begin with the prayer of Fatima. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly. And offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for all those sacrileges, outrages, and indifferences by which he himself is offended, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of thee the conversion of sinners. Amen. Saints Jacinta and Francisco Marto, pray for us, Our Lady of Fatima, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So as we learned in our last talk, at the very center of this message of Fatima is the reign of the Immaculate Heart alongside the Sacred Heart. Uh, emphasizing the word reign because that immediately makes us think of kingship, the monarchy, king and queen. That's the reign. The only way for us to have peace in the world is under the kingship of Jesus Christ, which will come about through his most blessed mother, Mary. And the current battleground that's being fought is the very authority of Christ. What you'll find in this message of Fatima and in everything that's taking place, and it's going to be a central theme for the rest of this talk, is the question of authority. Okay, the authority is very important. Ultimately, this goes back to the authority of God. God has all authority because God created us. God made us. Okay? All authority comes from God. And therefore, what the devil has been doing from the beginning of time is trying to challenge God's authority, trying to flip God's authority upside down. The devil wants to go right at the authority of Christ. He wants to challenge it and he wants to reject it. And so that is going to be a mark of the devil's work any time that authority is being attacked. That the authority of God, of Christ, of his church is being challenged. That authority is being abused and not used correctly by, let's say, the legitimate authorities. Or that authority is being illegitimately seized by one who should not have that authority. All those are the sorts of things that are attacking the very authority of God. Christ is king. Right? We have that battle cry, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ our king. And we have to be willing to shed our blood for this. And when we say that, and we profess our faith in this, yes, Christ must be king of every individual heart. He needs to be king of your heart and of my heart and of everyone's heart. But it goes beyond that. He needs to be the king of every family. And it goes beyond that. He has to be the king of every social, every religious, every political institution, of every nation and every state in the world. Christ must be king. Of the church, he must be king. Of unbeliever and believer alike, baptized and unbaptized, doesn't matter. Christ is your king. Period. End of story. That's the kingship of Christ. Okay? Everyone has to submit to him. Everyone must to submit to his laws, to the order he has created, to the hierarchy he has given in his church, to his vicars, starting with the pope, but the bishops, and then the priests, and then the family, the head of the family, the father. Everyone has to submit to his church, to his faith that he reveals. Again, because he created us, he has redeemed us, even now he is saving us, and in the future he would save us if it is that we get to heaven. Okay? So there's a lot of attacks against that. And that battle is a very, very old problem. It's really as old as sin itself. As I've already mentioned, Lucifer, the greatest of all the angels, rejected the authority of God. He did not want to obey. Non serviam, I will not serve. I'll do my own thing. Like, that's really Lucifer's only law. Do whatever you want. 
Just make sure you're not doing what God wants. Then do whatever feels good, do whatever you want. That's that very wide path down to hell. Adam and Eve listened to him, disobeyed the authority of God. Cain and Abel disobeyed the authority of God. At the time of Noah, everybody but eight were disobeying the authority of God, and so the world was destroyed in a great deluge, and only eight survived. And on and on it goes down through the centuries. That's why I say it's a very old problem, even, for example, right with Pontius Pilate. We see it there. It takes a really important place in the Gospels. If you recall, our Lord is on trial. Pilate goes in the hall to speak to him. This is from John chapter 8, verses 33 through 38. And he calls Jesus, and he says to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or of others told it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee up to me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. For this was I born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no cause in him. And a few verses later, he has Jesus horribly scourged. I find no cause in him. And then you scourge him to the point of death almost. Curious. We see Pilate's problem. Pilate doesn't even believe there's truth. Again, our Lord says, If you have an ear for the truth, you will hear me. His kingdom is not of this world. What does that mean? It means his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. His kingdom is ultimately the Catholic Church. Now, don't mistake this. When he says it's not of this world, that doesn't mean it's not in this world. It is. If you know, you and I are not of this world. We are not of the things of this world that are passing and fading or meant to be destroyed at the end of time. We are meant for something else. We're meant for another world. Okay, so we're not of this world. But we're certainly in it. We live in it day to day and we suffer in it. So we're in the world. Okay, but we're not of the world. So Christ's kingdom is not of the world. It means it doesn't belong to the things of this world. It means the way normal kingdoms are run, you know, with economics and battles and wars and these things and those things and all the little vicissitudes of human life. That doesn't apply to Christ's kingdom. He's worried about something else. He's worried about our soul, the eternal salvation of our soul. He's worried about truth. Those are the things that belong in Christ's kingdom. And so it's very much in this world. But many people won't acknowledge it or not aware of it. Right? They don't believe in truth, then they don't care, and then they go ahead and will scourge our Lord or crucify Him. So it's important to understand this kingdom of our Lord because it is being manifested through the Catholic Church. And again, the only way we'll ever have peace in this world is if we all submit to that kingship of Christ. So that's our goal. That's what we have to promote in our own life, in our own families, and as much as we can in our states. This teaching, we call it the social and universal kingship of Christ. Universal because it applies to all. Social because it applies to every dimension of man's social being. That's why we say not just in your heart, as if Jesus is just my personal Lord and Savior. Yes, yes, He is your personal Lord and Savior. But He's also your family's Lord and Savior. And He's your country's Lord and Savior. And He's your country's King, etc., etc., for the whole world. What we have to recognize here is that this social and universal kingship of Christ is touching on a very, very old problem. Not just the one I mentioned of Satan, but we could call it the uh, difficulty, the dilemma, the battle, if you will, between church and state. In fact, if you study church history, I would say one of the best ways to study church history, or even the history of man, is how does that battle between church and state take place? Because really, it shouldn't be a battle. It should be a harmonious, integrated whole. Church and state are supposed to go together under the kingship of Christ. Okay? 
This is one of the great errors that we, especially here in the United States, live under, but really under any modern republic, we live under it. There must be a right relationship between the church and the state, or between the pope and the emperor. Okay, the pope being the head of the church, the emperor being the head of the state. And you can trace this throughout history. There's been a battle because insofar as we sin, we don't go with the right mode, the right order that God is giving us. Again, if everyone acknowledges that Christ is king, if the pope acknowledges that Christ is king, and the emperor acknowledges that Christ is king, and all those under them do, then it's all going to work well together. But once one of those starts not obeying Christ as king, we certainly begin to have big problems. I think the best way to understand this is just think of our own human body. We have a soul and a body. The body is that material. The soul is my mind and my will. Those two always got to go together. They got to work together. Think of the body as the state and the soul as the church for the whole world. They, they got to work together. Now, sin, as you know, very often what happens is the body wants to buck against the soul the will. Now, the mind knows what is right and what is good and is seeking the good, but the body wants to indulge in the pleasures of the flesh or sloth or gluttony or things like that. Granted, the mind and the will can also buck and, and you know, are subject to sin as well. But there is that sort of tension. But we know that as a human being, my body and my soul kind of always got to go together and do things together. There is a tension that we feel. I mean, that, that's sin too. We all feel it. There's a tension between the two, but it's working best when my mind knows the truth, Jesus Christ, and my will is strong and agrees to it, and the body follows and is obedient. The same thing is going to be holding with the church and the state. Okay, so everything's going to work together well when the church knows the truth and has the strength to carry it out and to stand up for it, and then the state goes along and obeys. But, you know, you can get all of those twisted and usurped and the authority of God being challenged, and that, that's what happens and why we have these huge, huge problems in the world. You could even say it's patterned on Christ himself, the hypostatic union. We know that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. Again, the true God is that divine aspect. You can think of it as, in this model, the church, and the fact that he's true man is like the state aspect but Christ is that hypostatic union where the two are perfectly united and always do the will of God. Okay? And that, that's actually why we humans are the way we are. It's that we're patterned on who Jesus Christ, our Lord, is. God first envisioned how the second person of the Trinity will become man and then built us in that model. But we digress on that. Just so you have an idea here of how the church and state are supposed to work. So they do each have their own separate spheres. You know, the church does say, state, you have certain authorities that we're not going to take. And the state should look at the church and say, you have your own authority that we're not going to take. And just like my, my, my body is the one that needs to go out and collect food and eat and drink and sleep. Right? The mind and the will, they, they don't actually eat the food. But they certainly profit from the fact that the body's eating the food. They'd have problems if the body wasn't eating the food. Right? So in order for the mind and the will to be strong, the body's got to be doing its part. The mind and the will are helping it. So again, it's a really well-integrated way, the way we're supposed to work, so too church and state should work well. This separation of church and state that we live under is a horrible lie from the pit of hell. And many Catholics don't know this because we've stopped teaching this and preaching this, but that's really what this kingship of Christ is about, okay? That the church and state both have to be obeying Christ. In some ways, we might say that this reached a culmination. I'm about to explain a little bit of the history, but we got to sort of a point where we really understood it well, or at least the dogma, the teaching of the church was put forth clearly. I shouldn't say we understood it well. The teaching was put forth clearly by Pope Boniface VIII in 1302. It's an important time in history for me, I would say, because that's when Christendom, by most historians, acknowledged that it had reached its sort of zenith a kind of glory in civilization. Uh, the greatest cathedrals in the world were going up. Thomas Aquinas was doing scholastic theology. There were many saints penetrating the mysteries of God. It was a very, very Christian, very Catholic world. Uh, but there were still problems, obviously. Uh, and one of those problems was the Pope was having some issues with the King of France, 
Anyway, the Pope issued a bull. It's called Unum Sanctum in 1302. Look it up. It's a good read. It's only about a page. I'll just read you the very end of it. But in it, here's what the Pope says. And you're going to note that he uses his infallible authority. So this is de fide. It is infallible. Every Catholic must accept it as true. It is. The bull Unum Sanctum ends with Pope Boniface writing, Therefore, whoever resists this power, and he's talking about the authority of Peter that goes on in the Vicars of Christ. Ultimately, it's the power of Christ the King, but it's expressed by the Pope. Therefore, whoever resists this power, thus ordained by God, resists the ordinance of God. Unless he invent, like Manichaeus, two beginnings. Manichaeus was a heretic who came up with two different kinds of beginnings, which is false and judged by us heretical. Since according to the testimony of Moses, it is not in the beginnings, plural, but in the beginning, singular, the God created the heavens and the earth. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. And thus ends the bull. When he says, you know, decree, define, proclaim, that's infallible there. Uh, we're going to get to, don't forget this little bit about Manichaeus, because I think here the Pope was being extremely prophetic. Uh, the way I read that a lot is, see, God is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. If you're going to challenge God and challenge His authority, ultimately, I mean, you can take steps, but in the final analysis of it, you've got to challenge the beginning. And you've got to challenge the end. So you're going to challenge the end by basically saying, well, there's no heaven, there's no hell. Or variations thereof. Everybody goes to heaven. Souls are just annihilated at the end of time. Anything like that where you basically are attacking the end of man. And you're also going to attack the beginning. There's not just one beginning where God created, but there's beginnings. There's lots of different ways. There's multiverses. There's evolution. There's Big Bang cosmology. All of these things that are positing a different beginning other than the beginning that is the true beginning are extremely problematic. Okay? Because it's like the heretic Manichaeus. We have so many things in this world today, if you just think about it, if you just start going through all the things we consider entertainment, there's a lot of stuff like the Star Wars um, and all this fantasy literature and science fiction, all of these things posit a different beginning other than the true beginning. There's problems with that. And they may be subtle at first, and we may not always realize it. But all of these things that are positing different beginnings are ultimately part of this great attack against God's ultimate authority for God is the beginning and the end, and you must accept the true beginning. If you don't accept the true and correct beginning, you're going to get skewed. You all know if you're going down a road and you just take a little step wrong at the beginning, 100 miles later, you're way off course. Okay? So we have to have the right beginning. And part of the right beginning is God's authority as it's expressed in his church in this kingship of Christ, as Pope Boniface expresses it in this document, Unum Sanctum. So here, really brief, really brief survey of a historical background looking at this study uh, or studying this church-state problem, if you will, dilemma. How do we resolve it correctly? When the church first is created, obviously they're persecuted. We know this beginning of the church history. The Roman emperors persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. So how are they resolving it? Well, the state is completely on top and the church has to be destroyed with martyrdom. Obviously that didn't quite work out. The seed of the martyrs, or the blood of the martyrs, is the seed of Christianity. So Christianity grows, and eventually you get Emperor Constantine. 313 AD, the Edict of Milan, he says now Christianity can be persecuted. And then a few emperors later with Theodosius in 380, there's the Edict of Thessalonica, and Catholicism becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. Okay? So now we've sort of resolved that issue in a certain way because the church and the state are working together. But not really in the best way. Certainly better than before, uh, but really very often Constantine, even him, I mean, he's, he's a great, great man, did much for the church, but I would say in many ways he was more interested in the political stability of his kingdom, of his empire. He fought very hard to get it, fought a lot of revolutions, if you know your you know, Roman history. Uh, and in fact, he finally found peace, even having to fight his own son and you know, brother-in-law and all kinds of other stuff. And after he finds some level of peace, a big heresy breaks out in the church. It was the Arian heresy. And he thinks, oh no, here we go again. Now these 
heresies are going to rack my empire that I fought so hard to gain. So he actually talks to the Pope, Pope Sylvester, and his main advisor, Bishop Hosius of Cordova in Spain. And the Bishop and Bishop Hosius and the Emperor uh, and, the, and the Pope say, you should hold a council. We'll hold a council and we'll settle this dogmatic problem. And Constantine says, great idea, I'll foot the bill. So he pays all the money for all the bishops of the world to get together at Nicaea, and that's how we have the first great ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea in 325, which is where we got our creed from, and the Arian heresy was supposed to be squashed. So you see here how the emperor and the pope were working together. Uh, the emperor didn't have the solution himself. He needed political stability. He turns to the pope. The pope gives him an out. He supports it materially. There's a great council. The truth prevails. You know, that's kind of a good model of how it's supposed to work. Now, unfortunately, Constantine got some Arian bishops in his ear, and his sons even more so, and so they abandoned the true faith and then turned to the Arian heresy. And the church was thrown into massive confusion throughout the 4th century. This is the time of the great bishop Athanasius. Uh, so again, we have this problem going on, and then you know, we're going to keep going forward. You get a good emperor, finally, Theodosius, who brings back the Catholic faith, holds another council. They're trying to squash the Arian heresy. Again, pope and emperor working together for the truth. Things start going well again. Then we have the barbarian invasions in the West. And most of the barbarians had accepted the Arian heresy. So a lot of the barbarians are heretics. As you know, Rome falls. The historical date for that is 476. The empire continues, though, in the East, based out of Constantinople. Now you have a problem because the emperor in the East begins to exercise a lot of power over the pope. There was a period in time where, in fact, the Byzantine emperor in Constantinople would declare who the, king was, who the pope was going to be. That's how Gregory the Great sort of becomes pope. He had to approve it. If the emperor didn't approve it, the man wouldn't be pope. And sometimes they would assign the pope. And there's all this intrigue going on with the authority of the pope in Rome and the emperor and local Roman politics. And again, if you study this, you'll learn in the 8th and the 9th century, the papacy really fell into a terrible state uh, because of all these political sort of church-state questions. It was really that the state was taking power over the church. There's a heresy for that. The name is Cesaro Papism, where you basically think that the Caesar is also the Pope. So the secular authority is going to be head of the church. That's Cesaro Papism. And it's really run rampant in the East for a very long time. That's why the East was always going into schism. Time and time again, the East would fall into schism, and then they'd come back, almost like a yo-yo. And it happens many, many times throughout uh, the first 1,000 years of church history. In a definitive way, it happens in 1054. Not completely definitive, but since then, they've kind of never really been back. And they remain in schism, which is why we mentioned earlier that the Ro Russian Orthodox are still schismatic. So the Byzantine Empire is exerting its influence on the Pope. We had other problems. You know, this is when the Muslims rose up, took over much of the world. The Muslims is another aberration of church-state, right? They don't have the church-state relationship right either. Uh, I think it's a fair argument to say that in many ways Islam's not even a religion. It's more of a political philosophy and ideology that is very, very sort of with religious overtones. But they've blended the two and they've gotten it wrong. We did stop the Muslims at the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel. Charles Martel, a great Frankish king. France is the first daughter of the church because this is the first barbarian nation that becomes Catholic after the Dark Ages. His son is Pepin the Short. Remember this because Pepin the Short does something very important we're going to come back to. It's called the Donation of Pepin. So in 752, 756, he gives a land, the middle part of Italy, to the Pope. Okay? Uh, a large reason for this is because the barbarians kept attacking the Pope. So the barbarians are suffering from the Cesaro Papism too, the Lombard barbarians, and they want to control the Pope. And the only way for the Pope to get security was for this other king to come and save him, and that's what Pepin does. He marches the Franks down, they give the Lombards a whipping, and they say, this land is now the Pope's. And for the first time, the Pope gets some kind of temporal security. And the Pope becomes a temporal ruler, legitimately so, because the legitimate authority, Pepin the Short, gave him this land. It's called the Donation of Pepin, and it's what we would know as the Papal States. So from then on in history, from 756 on, the Pope is not just the spiritual head of the church, but he's also a temporal figure, a temporal authority of a certain land. And that is good and proper. Because it shows that Christ the King doesn't just have spiritual power, but he also needs to have temporal power. That's why that donation is so important. The papal states are very important. All right, so just bookmark that. We're coming back to it in just a minute. Uh, then you have Charlemagne. So Charlemagne reestablishes the Roman Empire in the West, and he again works very closely with the emperor and expands the empire so that it covers nearly all of Europe. Uh, so in, in many ways, the Holy Roman Empire has come back with Charlemagne 
with his sons. He has to split it up. You got the Frankish kingdom. You got the Germanic kingdom. The Germanic kingdom, which is kind of modern day Italy and Germany, becomes a Holy Roman Empire throughout much of history in the Middle Ages as we know it. And the battle keeps on going. So for a long time, the Holy Roman Emperor wants to control the church. You have these great battles. I mean, my favorite pope, I think, outside of maybe St. Peter, but is Gregory VII. Pope Gregory VII is perhaps the greatest reforming pope we ever had. The church was in very difficult times. Problems of simony and investiture and bishop absenteeism were rampant. And Gregory really cleaned it up. I mean, he comes after a long line of several other great reformers. Uh, but he really cleans up the church, and he goes head-to-head with the emperor. It is Henry IV at the time. Um, and Henry IV tries to kill him, tries to, you know, ban him. He has to excommunicate Henry IV a couple of times, mercifully forgives him. It's a wonderful story. But what you see is you, the point here is just that battle keeps going. You know, the emperor still kind of wants to control the church, wants to appoint the bishops, wants to have control of lands, wants to get the wealth of the church, etc. And the pope's having to fight for the church's independence, both spiritually and temporally. And really, in a sense, although Gregory VII dies as an exile, his legacy is that the church is going to win this war. Uh, but he keeps going. You know, it doesn't stop. You have Frederick Barbarossa, who's an heir of Henry IV, and he's fighting with, you know, Alexander III, and the emperor puts an anti-pope because the pope won't do what he wants, and you've got these great battles that, you know, we sort of know fuzzily happened. I won't go into all that history, but again, there, the pope comes on top. And that's really where we get to Boniface VIII now, which is where I read Unum Sanctum, that now the French king, Philip the Fair, was fighting Boniface. And Boniface was telling him, you have to submit to the pope. And in a Christian world, the the Pope was accomplishing this. Now, Philip the Fair, unfortunately, tried to assassinate uh, the Pope. So he attacked him at Anagni. It's a tragedy at Anagni. He almost killed Boniface. Boniface didn't quite die. He gets saved by the local populace there. But the next Pope who succeeds him, he he dies from that, from that terrible attack from Philip the Fair. And then the next Pope mysteriously dies. People think he was murdered by poison, again, by Philip the Fair, the King of France. And then the next Pope, who's Clement V, You might recognize that name because he's the one who begins the Avignon papacy. So at that point in time, after you had this great bull by Boniface declaring the supremacy of the pope, we now have this much weaker French pope who moves the papacy to Avignon. And basically the papacy falls under the thumb of the French king. And that discredits the papacy greatly because many of the kingdoms realize, well, you're not really the pope here, you're the French king's puppet. And that Avignon papacy lasts a long time, so we know, you know St. Catherine of Siena and some of the other great saints who bring him back. So finally, some 70 years later, the Pope comes back to Rome, but then what happens? Then there's more problems, and we get what's known as the Great Western Schism, where you have two popes, each one saying, I'm the real Pope, the other one isn't, and they excommunicate each other. You have the French Pope who goes back to Avignon, you have the true Pope who stays in Rome, and now all of Europe gets split. No one really knows who the Pope is. And then you have great chastisements coming down, like the Black Plague that is wiping out a third to a half of Europe. I mean, that's a real plague. Uh, you have the great St. Vincent Ferrer, who helps end the schism. You even got the three popes. But at the Council of Constance, that is ended 1417, St. Vincent Ferrer plays an instrumental role. Martin gets elected. But this is sad because all this time, you have a couple hundred years where Europe, Christendom, is losing confidence in the Pope. You know, he went off to France. Then we had two or three. People sort of stopped recognizing that we have to see the Pope as the vicar of Christ. It's only because that Avignon papacy took place and then the Great Western Schism, as well as corruption of the Renaissance popes, that paved the road for the Protestant Revolution. Okay, if, that, if those things hadn't happened, Protestantism could not have gripped Europe the way it did. But you had already had several centuries of sort of papal degradation. Okay? And then, of course, as you well know, most of the Protestant Revolution, although there were theological reasons by some, what really fuels it and gave it life is this issue of church-state. You see it most clearly with Henry VIII. Henry VIII was still willing to be a Catholic, but he wanted to be in charge of the church, primarily so he could have his divorce, to give in to his lustful passions. Okay? And once he did become head of the church, he stripped the church of all her wealth. England used to be the greatest Catholic country. There was no poverty in England because there were so many monasteries that took care of everyone. Well, Henry VIII stripped all that land of the monasteries, gave it to the various dukes and barons that had helped him, and then you know, there, were, there was terrible you know, poverty and other problems in England because he took all the wealth away from the church. That's what happens when the state gets control of the church. And that's why the German lords did that. The German lords lean into Lutheranism because they want control of the local churches and the power and the land and the wealth that came with that. 
So really what fueled Protestantism was not so much theological issues, was not even so much the abuse that was taking place in various places in the church, real as it is, uh, it was this lust for power and the state wanting to be in charge of the church. Okay? Again, there's a lot of other things, so I'm really streamlining it and trying to give you a stripped-down version of it, but that's basically what happens with the Protestant revolt. And then that continues in with Freemasonry and what we call the darkening. I know a lot of history books call it the Enlightenment. It is not the Enlightenment. Please try to strip that word from your vocabulary. It's the darkening, because our minds got dark. These are the philosophies of men like Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant, and all these crazy philosophies that came up, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, all of them were Freemasonic deists who wanted to reject Christ and wanted to establish a new way of doing things without religion. They used science, supposedly. They used reason. Uh, but they were going against the faith. And that's what fuels the French Revolution. Okay, so back now to the Sacred Heart and what could have stopped all of that. But it didn't because France wasn't consecrated. So Freemasonry grows, 1717. It really starts in a big way, the Grand Lodge in London. Uh, 1517 is an important date because that's when Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on the Church in Wittenberg. 1717, the first Grand Masonic Lodge in London. And of course, we're going to go all the way to 1917, which is Our Lady of Fatima and the Great Bolshevik Revolution. These three revolutions stand in a continuity. The Protestant Revolution rejects Christ's church very clearly. Okay? They reject his sacraments. They reject the Pope. In many ways, the Protestants reject the reality of the Incarnation. I want to write a book on that one day, how Protestantism is a rejection of the Incarnation. Maybe not intellectually, but in reality, that's what they reject. His church, his pope, his authority, his sacraments. Then come the Freemasonic deists 200 years later, and they basically reject Christ. Oh, we'll accept some vague, ambiguous concept of God, a God everybody can agree in, a God who's like a big clockmaker. He just got the world in motion and then has let it apart. And that opens the door, of course, to all the things like evolution and the Big Bang theories, which then is supporting atheistic materialism. The only thing that exists is this material world, and there is no God. So we reject the church, Protestants. We reject Christ, the Freemasonic deists. We reject God completely, the atheistic, Bolshevik, communistic revolution. Okay, and that's what's fomented throughout the 1800s. Men like Karl Marx, who pushed forth communism. Men like Friedrich Nietzsche with their will to power, or Sigmund Freud, where you know, everything's about violations of the Sixth Commandment. All these thinkers of the world that are destroying the world are stemming from this evil, diabolical tradition, an attack on Christ and his vicar, a rejection of God's authority. So we want to be able to connect the dots and see how all of these things are part of this sort of great revolution attacking the kingship of Christ. Papal authority is inseparable from the kingship of Christ. And so when you want to attack the kingship of Christ, you've got to attack the papal authority. And that's what I hope you've seen in this very brief survey of history. But we don't even need to look at history. We could just look at Scripture. So if someone asks you about the papacy, where do you turn to in Scripture? Anybody know offhand? Very good. Matthew 16, 16. There are two main places to look at. Matthew 16, 16 and verses there. And also Luke chapter 22, which is the Last Supper. Let's look at both of those. Obviously in Matthew 16, what's taking place? Ah, we'll look at Luke first. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 34. Peter's all gung-ho, right? It's the Last Supper. Our Lord is telling them what's going to happen. And Peter is basically saying, no matter what happens, I'll follow you. We all know what's going to happen to Peter a little while later. He's going to betray our Lord. So the Lord turns to them and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith will fail not. And thou, being once converted, confirm the brethren. Peter then says to him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Jesus said to him, I say to thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, till thou thrice deniest that thou knowest me. This is the papacy in a nutshell, and we'll see it again in Matthew. What, what's going on here? First of all, Satan desires to have the Pope. That's not going to change. If Satan gets the Pope, he's got the authority of God on this earth. So Satan is going after the papacy. That's why the Pope plays such a central role in Fatima. But Christ is going to pray for him, so that the faith will fail not. The truth of the faith. He says, you're going to have to be converted the Pope's needs a conversion. Once you return to me, 
then you will confirm your brethren. I don't know about you, but I read that, I'm like, that sounds like Fatima. That sounds like the Pope calling all the bishops to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, confirming his brethren in the faith. This is what we have to do. It's the same pattern here. It doesn't change. Our Lord laid it out right there. That's who Peter is. Okay? Um, and, of course, he says, you're going to deny me. We don't think enough about that denial. I was actually at a retreat recently, and the priest did a wonderful job in making me think about that denial. In many ways, he says, in some ways, the denial is worse than what Judas did. Judas sells him for money. Um, the problem with Judas was that when he realized what he had done wrong and even gave the money back, he despaired, and he went and committed suicide. Peter, on the other hand, says, I do not know him. He rejects. He says, I don't know him. Three times, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I, I, I'm, I'm stretching it a little here, but think scripturally. Think typologically. That's apostasy. That, that's what it is, a lack of faith. When I say, I don't know who Christ is. When I reject who he is. This is apostasy. This is a rejection of who God is. I would say, fundamentally, this is a problem many right now of our hierarchy have. Our bishops and our priests and our pope, even if they don't say it, they don't know Jesus. They don't know Christ. And they're saying they do, but they're, they're, what they're teaching, they don't know him. Okay, Peter just said that. They're living it out. Now, the big difference again, though, and here's the big difference, is that Peter converted. Peter repented. Peter came back to the Blessed Mother. He said, I'm sorry for what I've done. And there's a great tradition, if you don't know it, that for the rest of his life, Peter had these great furrows running down his cheeks because he never stopped crying over what he had done. So he never stopped shedding tears over that. There was great conversion in Peter. That's what makes Peter different from Judas. Both fell and fell hard, and in many ways, Peter fell harder. And he was our first pope, and he's our greatest pope. But we could say, in a way, he committed apostasy. But he converted, and he returned, okay? Because Christ prayed for him to confirm his brethren in the faith. So that's the papacy. We cannot expect anything less from the papacy. Catholics are clueless about who the Pope is, and they don't even study Scripture. You already know that the Pope is going to commit apostasy and go against Christ. And it's all going to seem lost, but we have to pray for him too, the mystical body of Christ. That's why Our Lady of Fatima keeps saying, pray for the Pope, pray for the Pope, pray for the Pope. Do a lot of penance for the Pope. Christ will pray for him. And he will convert. He will return. And then he'll confirm the brethren of the faith. Russia will be consecrated. You see the exact same thing here, basically, in Matthew. So when the papacy is established in Matthew, let's look at that. This is chapter 16, verses 13 through, 35, through, verses 13 through 25. And Jesus came into the quarters of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? But they said, Some John the Baptist, others Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus saith to them, But whom do you say that I am? That's a very important question, because he's always asking all of us that. Who do you say that I am? Hopefully we're saying, you're Christ the King. We really have this faith. Details in Scripture are so important, and they're often lost on us. But Matthew is insistent. This happened at Caesarea Philippi. Why Caesarea Philippi? Why did our Lord choose that place? Again, everything is perfect. Well, let's just look at the name first. St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, always studies the names. So Caesarea, what's Caesarea named after? Caesar, the king of the empire. Okay, this is the political authority. This city is named after him, and there's a cult to the emperor in Caesarea Philippi. This is where he's going to establish his kingship, assert his, Christ is going to assert his kingship and his vicars. Philippi, that's Philip the Tetrarch, so you're familiar with him, he's the local king. So there's a city named after the great imperial ruler in Rome that governs the whole world, and the local ruler of the king, and there's a cult to them there in this city, and that's where Christ will assert his own authority, and that of his church, and that of the pope. And then there's this bit about, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail. Well, what else is going on in Caesarea Philippi? It was a terrible city dedicated to the god of the underworld, of Pan. There's actually a cave there. And they believed that there was this cave that took you down into the underworld. And they'd gotten some mixed up stuff like from Greek mythology. They believed spirits lived down there, would come up, you know, bring back spring, would go back in their winter. And in order to have the spring come back and have all this life, you have to give sacrifices, blood sacrifices, child sacrifices. So there's a terrible cave there in Caesarea Philippi where there was this worship to the god Pan. Pan, if you know him, he's the one that looks the most like the devil. He's got the horns, he's got the hooves, he's got the tail. Um, I really think the devil appeared to someone, and that's where Pan came from, you know, back in, you know, centuries, you know, hundreds of years ago. But there was the worship of this diabolical human sacrifice with all kinds of sexual immorality, because those things always go hand in hand, 
That's what takes place there at Caesarea Philippi. The people alive at that time knew that was the cult there. So you've got all this mix-up of sort of like Satanism and occultism, and you've got this sort of false worship of the state, and this is the place where Christ will establish his church. It's very important. You know, so that's why we've got to like study some of these details with the scriptures. Okay, continuing on here, now that we know where we're at and where Christ is going to do this. Simon Peter then speaks up. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You are God. And Jesus answered, saying to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. So this didn't come from Peter himself. This came from God. It's God's revelation, truth, faith, being given to Peter, Peter opening himself up to the Holy Ghost and thinking not with the eyes of men, but with the eyes of God. And that's why Christ is now going to establish his church on him. And then we know these words are quite famous to us as Catholics. And I say to thee, thou art Peter, the rock. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Remember, the gate of hell is just a little further away, that cave. The gate of hell will not prevail against it. All this satanic, you know, violations of the sixth commandment, that will not prevail against my church. It has profound meaning for us today. Because some people think it is prevailing. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth, it shall also be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose upon earth, it shall be loosed in heaven. Kingship of Christ, now given to his vicar. The Pope now has all authority that Christ the King has. That ties us in with the bull, Unum Sanctum, of Boniface VIII, in this whole church-state problem at Caesarea Philippi. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and that the ancients and the scribes and the chief priests would put him to death, and on the third day he would rise again. So after this full manifestation that he really is God and Peter's confession, now he starts telling them to get ready. The cross is coming. I'm going to die, but I will rise. And when he begins to teach them that, what happens? And Peter, taking Jesus aside, began to rebuke him. Did you hear that? Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. The audacity to rebuke God. But that's what Peter does, okay? So don't be surprised by some of the things the Pope does. Peter, taking Jesus aside, began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, be it far from thee, this shall not be done to thee. They're not going to crucify you. They're not going to do all these things to you. Who, this is Jesus, turning, said to Peter, Go behind me, Satan. Thou art a scandal unto me. Because thou savorest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. So here you see the Pope. Again, in one minute, he's listening to God and taking the revelation and saying, you're the son of the living God. We get the papacy. A little while later, don't go to the cross. You can't do that. They can't kill you. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Because he's thinking like men. He is not savoring the things of God, but the things of men. This is the history of the papacy in a nutshell. The Pope can think like men, and that's get behind me, Satan. Or the Pope can think in divine terms, and that's gates of hell will not prevail. This is where my church will not fall. And we've seen that throughout history. Just look at the papacy. It goes back and forth. So right now we're living in a time where the popes are thinking like men. They're thinking with human wisdom and not with the divine wisdom. They've, they're not thinking with the faith. And so it's get behind me, Satan but there'll be the conversion. Don't forget what we just read from Luke. And of course, after that, Jesus says, Disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For he that will save his life shall lose it. He that shall lose his life for my sake will find it. So there again, we have the cross standing at the center of all of this. The cross at the center of the papacy, the cross at the center of Christ's kingship, and the cross at the center of the message of Fatima. <coughs> so back to our historical survey very quickly to finish up. After the French Revolution, which was an attack on altar and throne, and all the great Christian kingdoms were falling apart, the Pope was really the last bastion. And we had some great popes that stood up to the revolution. You had Pius IX, you had Leo XIII, you had Pius X, also Gregory XVI before. You have nearly a hundred years of really great popes standing up to the revolution. But that diabolical revolution keeps growing. This is the time that we talked about of Marx and of Nietzsche and of Sartre. And just the 1800s were filled with revolution. And the Freemasons were very active. I mean, they'd already been active in sort of suppressing the Jesuits. The Pope had gone along with that. And that's how the French Revolution broke out. 
You have the dream of John Bosco. Hopefully you all are familiar with that dream of John Bosco and the role the Pope plays. You have the vision of Pope Leo on the 13th of October, 1874, 33 years before Fatima, where the devil gets 100 years to wreck his havoc in the church from our Lord. All of those things are going on. And then you have the Italian Revolution. Right, so the Italian Revolution cut Vatican I short. Vatican I was supposed to be a longer council, but the Italian revolutionaries, children of the French Revolutionary, men like Giuseppe Garibaldi, baptized Catholic, Vittorio Emanuele the King, Cavour, the political analyst, I mean, they all came and they basically wanted to unify Rome, I mean, unify Italy, and so they put all the different pieces of Italy together and then they took the Papal States away from the Pope. And in 1870, they marched on Rome itself and the Vatican, so that's why the First Vatican Council ended abruptly and the Pope became a prisoner in the Vatican. So many of you know, for many years, the Pope was a prisoner in the Vatican. He'd lost all his temporal power. That donation of Pepin from 756 had now been taken away from him. But all of those Popes, Leo XIII and Pius X and Pius IX before them, kept saying, this is unjust. This is not right. You cannot do this. This is authority unlawfully seized. And that's what the revolutions are all about. Authority unlawfully seized. And that's what they had done to the Pope. They had taken away his papal states and his temporal power unlawfully, and that's basically what they're doing to Christ. They're trying to take away his power unlawfully. And then we have a very sad, sad event. I think it's a very sad event, and I don't think it gives enough credit, but it ties us into Fatima. Remember we said that vision of Tui took place June 13th, 1929. Why that day? In 1917, Our Lady said, I will come later and ask for the consecration of Russia. And then on June 13, 1929 is when she does. What, what got that moving? Well, it's the Roman question. The Roman question is what they call this issue of the Vatican and the Pope being a prisoner in the Vatican. As I told you, the Popes kept protesting. Once he became Pope, you couldn't even leave the Vatican. I mean, they wanted to kill him. They actually desecrated Pius IX. Pius IX, when he dies, there was such hatred by the revolutionaries that they had to do a fake out. So they had one funeral procession going, and the revolutionaries attacked it and attacked that body, but they had Pius somewhere else. And they had done that on purpose, knowing that they were going to attack. That's the great hatred. Pius X locked in the Vatican, couldn't even go see his family members. Okay? So Pius XI finally resolves this issue. He gets together with Benito Mussolini, and they sign the Lateran Treaty. You may have heard of the Lateran Treaty. That is what created the Vatican City State that exists today. It's the smallest country in the world. They sign it on February 11th, 1929, which is the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes. I think that's also very important and very significant. And in effect, what did the Pope agree here? Okay, you give me this tiny, tiny plot of land, and I renounce all my temporal authority. Those papal states that you took from me, my predecessors, that are rightfully mine, all the way down from Pepin, 752, 756, I relinquish it. I shouldn't have authority anymore. I shouldn't have that temporal authority. You let us practice our faith. You let us practice the Catholic faith. You give me a few things here and there. You kind of leave me alone. We'll have peace. But I forego, I willingly give up this heritage that the popes had. And so the pope gives up all his temple authority. And he basically says, I shouldn't have temple authority. I should only have a spiritual authority. That's the latter treat in a nutshell. That's a problem because that goes against the kingship of Christ. Ironically, in 1925, just a few years before that, Pius XI is writing the great encyclical, Quas Primus, which establishes the Feast of Christ the King. But that was Pius XI's problem. It's like he would write something, but he wouldn't follow through with it in his actions. And you see this with Christ the kingship. So he signs the Lateran Treaty, and now he gives up all the Pope's authority, his temporal authority. That, but that treaty doesn't take effect, although it's signed on February 11th, doesn't take effect, so I guess you know, up until then it hasn't happened, until June 7th, 1929. So less than a week later, our Lord comes down and our Blessed Mother comes down and says, now is the time to consecrate Russia. So why? That's what we're going to explore it in the last talk, but just remember this very important piece. In order to consecrate something, you must have authority over it. I can consecrate myself to the Blessed Mother, but I can't consecrate you because I don't have authority over you. A priest could consecrate his parish, a pastor could consecrate his parish, but he couldn't consecrate a diocese. A bishop could consecrate his diocese, but nothing else. A president could consecrate his country, but you can only consecrate what you have authority over. Okay? Otherwise, it doesn't work. So for the Pope to consecrate Russia, what does it mean? It means you, Pope, have spiritual and temporal authority over Russia. 
Russia, the greatest country in the world land-wise, Russia, the greatest country in the world atheistically wise, most opposed to God now with this atheistic revolution that's taken place, you, Pope, now have to assert before the whole world, and you have to get all your bishops with you to agree, we have authority over Russia, and we can consecrate it. That's what the consecration in part means. There's more to it in the next talk. But it makes sense that right when the Pope is giving up all this temporal authority, and it's like, okay, you've really taken a wrong step here. Now, the only way out of this is for you to assert you do have authority. You've got to get back to the truth, the truth of who the Pope is, the truth of who Christ the King is, and you've got to consecrate Russia, the greatest atheistic, largest country in the world, to the Immaculate Heart so these great miracles will take place. God always has the right solution to our problems. But there's even more of the consecration of Russia, which we're going to look at in the final part.